Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Come on, me. All right, so this is the fourth of a seven-part series of New Zealand wine. This episode and the last episode, along with this one, are reviews of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc that were sent to me in conjunction with this really cool map uh, of Marlboro, uh, also provided uh, to me for free by the Appalachian Wine Marlboro Organization. I have free range to review this wine how I like. After this episode, there won't be any until March as I prepare to take my advanced sommelier theory exam on February 22nd. After the exam, I'll record a three-part in-depth series on New Zealand wine. All right, wine, wine. Anyway, Forest Winery, not much to glean from their website. They've been around for quite a while, however. The property has been in the family for, quote, generations. The founders, John and Bridget Forrest, had successful careers in scientific research and medicine. John specialized in neurophysiology, and Bridget was a general practitioner specializing at first in pregnancy care, birth, and families. She transitioned to being a community uh, geriatrician managing the physical and mental health of older people and then hospice care. They founded, uh, they founded the winery in 1988 uh, when the wine industry, especially in Marlboro, was very small. Their first vintage was 1990. Notably, they had an overfilled fermenter that accidentally created a trophy-winning Merlot Rosé. The winery is located just outside the town of Renwick. John is known for making lower alcohol wines, being a pioneer of the screw cap, and pushing the boundaries in New Zealand wine. Their daughter, Beth, is their general manager and winemaker. She has a master's in enology from Adelaide University. From her bio, it looks like she's similar to her father and likes to push the boundaries of winemaking and experimenting. Like all the wines from this series, they are part of the Appalachian Marlboro Wine Organization. This means that the wine is 100% Marlboro fruit, so you won't find lower priced or quality or lower quality fruit from outside the Appalachian to reduce cost. The winery is located in Marlboro and therefore produced in Marlboro. And that's about it. Let's get the stats for this wine. The 2022 Force Sauvignon Blanc suggested retail price $22 from the Marlboro GI, 100% Sauvignon Blanc. Four vineyards around Renwick. Soil is gravel rich, free draining. Machine harvested, cold settled, cold fermentation in stainless steel tanks. Age surly, though no time, no length of time is given. It has a small oak component. Not sure what that really means. Uh, the ABV is 12.5%. The RS, or residual sugar, is 3.8 grams per liter. The pH is 3.25. And the TA, or total acidity, is 7.6 grams per liter. It appears that a small amount of the wine is aged in oak barrels, probably used barrels, meant to provide a little bit of oxidation. Cold settling just means that after the grapes were pressed, they allowed the solids to settle in the bottom of the tanks. It's done, uh, it's done cold to prevent fermentation from starting too early. Once everything is settled, then fermentation begins at a cooler temperature. This helps with having a crisp, fresh style of wine. It shouldn't be an over-the-top fruity wine, if I understand this correctly. We're about to find out, though. All right, let's get into the wine. Again, screw cap. Fan of that. Oh, get my little whoozy what's in here, my thingamajig. Alrighty. So doing this series has been really educational. Um, while you won't see the in-depth series till after the exam, um, it's been great to research all that. So I should be good to go on that section of the exam. Though last year I only had two questions about New Zealand and they were both related to the same region. So anyway, uh, 
And again, this map is really cool before we get into it. I know I put it up already, but this map is super cool. Please make sure you watch that first episode where I go th more detail the map, do like close-ups of everything. Um, I said in the first ep in the episode about the map that the more you look at it, the more you find. And I mean, you find it with other maps, but there's lots of details on this thing that's just really cool to look at. All right, let's check it out. So different than the other two wines, lots of bubbles in here from the Coravin. Um, so just, it was more noticeable to me. Anyway, color looks good, but there's, I guess, you know, I got kind of a haze. I don't know. I don't think, I think it's just the, I think it's just how it worked out, how it came out of the bottle. It does look like there's particles, like it's kind of hazy. So is it, I don't remember them saying it's unfiltered or no finding. Let's look at the back label. I didn't look at that. Yeah, there's nothing there. Okay, it says vegan friendly. So if they did do any uh, finding or fil finding, then um, they didn't use any animal products for it. I'm just going to go back here and see if there's anything in here. Cold settled. So I I'm thinking that they don't really do much. That's probably why it looks like there's a little bit of like unfilteredness to it, which is fine. No big deal. So on the nose, uh, citrus forward, nothing's jumping out at you, which is what they, they, they said. They, they're trying to not have a super um, uh, over-the-top type of fruity wine. So definitely not over-the-top. Kind of not muted, but, you know, subdued, muted. But it's a citrus tropical fruit aroma. Uh, let's just get on the palate because there's not much else going on here. I mean, it's it's minerally... You know, obviously, you know, there it says oak treatment, but I don't get anything like new oak on this. So it's probably more of an oxidative type of thing rather than just like imparting flavors and aromas. I just taste it. Hmm. Like what happens with a lot of wine, everything's on the palate. So it's in many ways similar to the Clos Henriot. The Clos Henri, not Henriot. Clos Henri. Um, Henri is a completely different winemaker in France. Um, more similar to this, but it ha this has more fruit. I mean, the Henri is really that subtle, like, I don't like to say elegant necessarily, but that really kind of, I don't have better words to say other than subtle, sophisticated, I don't know, but not in your face. This is not in your face by any means, but it's kind of in between the two. So this was a more in your face wine. This was really not so much, and this is kind of in between. Mm. Still tasting it though. It definitely has a long finish to it. It's not just the acidity, which the acidity is noticeable. All of them are, have great acidity, by the way. But yeah, it's um, citrusy. So more orange, a little, a little grapefruit, but not a ton of grapefruit. Um, mango, papaya type of thing. A little guava. Not really any pyrazine going on here. So this two out of three wines don't really have any pyrazine going on. So this may be a trend with New Zealand. I don't drink a ton of New Zealand wines, but the ones I do drink aren't necessarily at this quality level. They're usually that 10 to $15 bottle range, um, just what I have access to. Um, and they tend to be more over the top with grapefruit and the papaya and the guava and you know, all, those, all those fruits and in your face bell pepper. Like this is not that. I'm, my feeling is two to three wines are not that. I, I'm guessing that they're trying to get away from that maybe stereotypical thing. And maybe they're trying to show what the what the land can do, what, what the terroir can do, and not just kind of by the numbers, uh, just make generic tasting New Zealand, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. With that said, I'm not saying that this one tastes like that because it definitely has a uh, higher quality than a lot of those 10 to $15 bottles of wine coming, coming from there. But this one had more of what I'm used to from New Zealand, whereas these um, just kind of dial it back a little bit. And that's cool. Not every wine needs to be in your face. And this, is, this isn't super in your face, but it's more noticeable. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like there's, there's some really good citrus and, and tropical fruit flavors going on there. It's like a really, just a great fruit cup. It's more on the orange, lemon, lime side rather than that grapefruit side. And that papaya, mango, guava coming through, um, very minerally, not a lot of stuff going on there, crushed rock, um, 
there's a touch of that Hawaiian pizza thing going on. So yes, a little pineapple, maybe a hint, just a barest hint of bell pepper going on. Um, this, this is a wine that if I was trying to figure it out, I'd probably go New Zealand on it. Um, but again, I could potentially take this to Sancerre. Um, this is a tweener wine. Uh, this is a wine that, you know, could go either way with that. But I would probably lean towards uh, New Zealand on it. And there's still bubbles going on in here. Not, not bubbles like a champagne where, you know, they're constantly coming up. But there's definitely a little bit of carbonation that, that stayed in there. And screw caps kind of do that. It's a little bit of a trick when you're doing blind tasting. When you know it's a still wine and after it's been poured, you have a decent amount of bubbles in there. Um, screw cap wines tend to, this is not a hundred percent like for sure certain thing, but screw cap wines tend to have a little bit of spritz to them or a little bit of carbonation, not a frizzante thing, you know, not intentional, not like they, they, they don't intentionally carbonate it, but because of the nature of the screw cap, it kind of captures some CO2 and it kind of stays in the wine a little bit and you kind of notice it in bubbles. This one had the most of all of them. The other two, well, this was not screw cap. This one, I didn't really notice any extra bubbles. It, it poured, it was fine. Um, but this one, there's definitely some more bubbles to it, you know, a few minutes after the fact. So that's a little tip for you when you're trying to do your, your um, uh, blind tastings because know where the screw caps are. New Zealand, if I, was in, if I was in an exam and I had a significant amount of bubbles in this, you know, at knowing that they'd poured it probably five minutes prior and I still saw bubbles and I made a comment about it, that would, and knowing this is, and, and having a high probability of being Sauvignon Blanc, I'm taking New Zealand. And then at that point, I'm just going Marlboro. Why? Because Marlboro produces more Sauvignon Blanc than anywhere else in the world. Um, and so some of this is, you know, just knowing your market, knowing your theory, you know, who produces the most of what. Sorry to go on that tangent. It's a good wine though. I like it. If I had to rank the wines, because this is the third episode, this is the one that I'd probably prefer on, on the surface the most because it's it's the most familiar of, of the New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs. Then this one, and then this one. But what is the most interesting to me? I think this one's the most interesting to me because I want to peel back some more layers. I want to, I want to like open this bottle and drink it over a couple hour period of time and really delve into it and see what, see what it's got. Um, this is more like, I just want some good wine. Um, that's high quality, not like, you know, chuggable, but like just really good high quality wine. That's like, yeah. And this one's kind of in between. They're all excellent quality, you know, 20 to $25 ish price range. Um, at least in the U S market. So remember like one of them I found, it was like $13. <laughs> okay or $20 in New Zealand, it's like $13 US. That's always you have to remember that something we're paying $20 to $30 in the US for an imported wine is usually a more value priced wine in the country of origin. This is how it works. Um, when we start getting to $50, $100 import, now we're getting into, you know, 50, you know, 25 to 50 bucks local prices. So I think all three are excellent quality. Um, I will enjoy all three of them at some point, probably really soon. And that's going to do it for today's show. So if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and tell all your friends. And we'll see you next time, hopefully with some forest something along. Cheers.